Hello and welcome everybody. Today we will be discussing and analyzing Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. There is unrest in the Galactic Senate. Several thousand solar systems have declared their intentions to leave the Republic. This separatist movement under the leadership of the mysterious Count Dooku has made it difficult for the limited number of Jedi Knights to maintain peace and order in the galaxy. Senator Amidala, the former Queen of Naboo, is returning to the Galactic Senate to vote on the critical issue of creating an army of the Republic to assist the overwhelmed Jedi. What's basically being said here is that there is more political turmoil and systems across the galaxy are uniting to rebel against the Republic. Padme Amidala is heading to the Senate to discuss and vote on the creation of a Republic army. We see her ship being escorted by N1 starfighters. Now this big silver ship is called the J-Type Diplomatic Barge and it is used by the royalty of Naboo for diplomatic transport. The first true character we see in this movie is R2. As you can see, he gets a special close-up. One of the reasons for this is to remind the audience that Star Wars is ultimately being told through R2. All the massive and important events that happen in the story are when R2 is present, and you'll see an example of that by the end of the film. The ship explodes and lets the audience know visually that there is a plot to assassinate the now Senator Amidala. Padme runs over to Corday and tries to see if she's okay. However, she dies honorably as she was a decoy for Senator Padme. We cut to Palpatine's office and see that Palpatine is worried that more and more star systems are joining the Separatists and is unsure if he can hold off the vote any longer. He mentions how he won't let this republic that has stood for a thousand years be split in two. Now some critics try to point out this as a continuity error because of what Obi-Wan said in A New Hope, which was, For over a thousand generations the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the old republic, before the dark times, before the empire. Obi-Wan is talking about the totality of the Republic, everything pre-Empire. Palpatine is referring to the current era of the galactic government. There's more detail about this in the expanded universe, specifically Darth Bane Rule of Two, as there was an event called the Rusan Reformation. That reformed the Republic government that is responsible for the differentiation of the Old Republic and the prequel era Republic. If you want to know a little bit more about the Rusan Reformation, here is an excerpt from the Darth Bane Rule of Two audiobook that talks about the Reformation in more detail. However, if you rather continue with the movie, then you can skip to this timestamp. Master Valentine, Valorum said, clasping Farfalla's hand in an efficient, well-practiced gesture of welcome. Thank you for coming on such short notice. You didn't leave me a lot of options, Your Excellency, Valentine noted. I apologize for that. The Chancellor replied, even as he turned and extended his hand to Johan. And this must be your apprentice, he said, taking note of the long braid that marked the young man as one who had not yet completed his initial Jedi training. I am Padawan Johan O'Thone, Your Excellency. Balorum's grip was firm but not overpowering, the perfect politician's handshake. He pumped Johan's arm twice, then pulled his hand free and indicated the chairs around the conference table. Please, noble Jedi, make yourselves comfortable. Farfalla took the end seat on the near side of the table. Johan sat down in the chair directly across from him, leaving the Chancellor the lone seat at the head of the table between the two Jedi. Once everyone was in position, it was Farfalla who initiated the discussion, turning slightly to better face Valorum. The message you sent me was most unexpected, Your Excellency, and the timing was somewhat inconvenient. We are still dealing with the aftermath of the thought bomb on Rusan. I understand your position, Master Valentine, but you must also appreciate mine. News of the Brotherhood's defeat has reached the Holonet, 
As far as the public is concerned, the war is over, and the Senate is eager to put this unpleasantness behind us. As are the Jedi, Farfalla replied. But this motion you plan to put forward, the so-called Rusan Reformation, calls for some rather extreme measures. That is why I brought you here to discuss the recommendations before we vote on them. Bolorum added, I wanted you to understand why this has to be done. Joe Hun had not seen the details of the message Farfalla had received, nor had his master spoken of it to him during their journey to Coruscant. As a result, he was having difficulty piercing their political double-talk. Fortunately, Farfalla chose to cut through the diplomatic niceties and address the issue directly in his next response. Do you realize the ramifications of what you are asking, Tarsus? Your proposal calls for the Jedi to renounce their military ranks and completely disband all our military, naval, and starfighter forces. You are asking us to destroy the Army of Light. The Army of Light was created as a reaction to the Brotherhood of Darkness. Valorum countered. With the Brotherhood gone, it no longer serves a purpose. Johan couldn't believe what he was hearing. Its purpose is to protect the Republic, he burst out, unable to contain himself. Protected from who? The Chancellor challenged, snapping his head around to address him. The Sith are gone. The Sith are never truly gone, Johan said darkly. And therein lies the problem, Belorum replied. Over the past four centuries, we've seen the Jedi declare war on the agents of the Dark Side time and time again. It is a struggle that never ends. And with each conflict, more civilians are swept up in your web of war. Innocent beings die as armies align with you or your enemies. Worlds loyal to the Republic break away, fracturing a once united galaxy. It is time to put a stop to the cycle of madness. Farfalla held up his hand, cutting Johan off, before the young man could say anything else. He waited for Valorum to turn his attention away from the Padawan, then asked, Tarsis, do you really believe the changes you have proposed will do that? I do, Master Valentine. There was undeniable conviction in his voice. There are many good people who fear the Jedi and what they are capable of. They see the Jedi as instigators of war. You claim your actions are guided by the Force, but to those who cannot feel its presence, it appears as if your order is not accountable to anyone or anything. And so you want the Jedi to answer to you. Farfalla sighed. The Chancellor and the Senate. I want you to answer to the elected officials who represent the citizens of the Republic. Balorum declared. Then he added, This is not an attempt to grab power for myself. The Jedi Council will still oversee your order. But they will do so under the supervision of the Senate's Judicial Department. It's the only way we can heal the scars left by your wars against the Sith. The Republic is crumbling, he continued. For the past thousand years, it has slowly been decaying and rotting away. A rebirth is the only way to reverse this process. Many of the measures proposed in the Rusan Reformation are symbolic, but there is power in that symbolism. This will be the beginning of a new era for the Republic. We will enter a new age of prosperity and peace. Palpatine believes his negotiations will not fail. Mace Windu responds by saying that if his negotiations do fail, he must understand that there aren't enough Jedi to counter the Separatists, and adds that the Jedis are keepers of the peace, not soldiers, which is a bit of irony of what will happen throughout the Clone Wars. Palpatine then asks Yoda if the conflict will lead to war. Yoda responds by saying, how the dark side clouds everything, which we can infer that there's a level of power the dark side has on the force that reduces the Jedi's capability of using it, such as confusing the Jedi of what the force is telling them and has them constantly guessing what the future might look like. This is something I wish the movie expanded upon and explained how the dark side affected the Jedi 
just so we can get more explanation of how the dark side works and how manipulative it is. I just think it would have been interesting to see. Padme Amidala and the Loyalist Committee have arrived. Padme wonders if they have any idea who is behind the attack. Mace Windu responds by saying that one of their intelligence agencies points to disgruntled spice miners on the moons of Naboo, but Padme doesn't buy it and instead believes it was Count Dooku. Kiadi Mundi refutes this by saying that Count Dooku is a political idealist, not a murderer. Windu adds that Count Dooku was once a Jedi and that it is not in his character to assassinate anyone. Now within the films, you don't see Dooku murder anyone, but he does give orders to kill and murder for political gain, which we will see later on in the movie. Also, there's some idiots who say that it's Palpatine trying to kill Padme, and let me save you some time, it's not. Sidious really has nothing to do with it. In my next video of this series, we will dive into it. Hint, what Padme said about Dooku should give you a clue to who's really behind it. And no, it's not Dooku per se, however, he is a part of it. Anyway, Palpatine suggests that Padme be placed under the protection of one of the Jedi. Padme doesn't feel comfortable with that, but Palpatine adds that the situation is very serious and that being placed with someone she's more familiar with, like Obi-Wan Kenobi, might make her feel better about it. Mace Windu says that that's possible and that Obi-Wan just returned from a border dispute on Ancyon, which is an EU reference to the book called The Approaching Storm by Alan Dean Foster. Palpatine guilt trips Padme into doing it by saying, Do it for me, milady, please. The thought of losing you is unbearable. Very cunning, very manipulative. The transition into the next scene, we get really nice, beautiful John Williams music and fun banter between Obi-Wan and Anakin. Thank you, Master Windu. You seem a little on edge. Not at all. I haven't felt you this tense since, since we fell into that nest of gun dogs. <laughs> you fell into that nightmare, Master, and I rescued you, remember? Oh, yes. <laughs> You're sweating. Relax. Take a deep breath. I haven't seen her in ten years, Master. This is a really nice interaction between Obi-Wan and Anakin, and it doesn't give enough praise. It establishes that they are friends and have a special bond with one another. Throughout the movie, we see them arguing a lot, but the way they argue is like how siblings argue with one another, especially if it's a big brother, little brother relationship. And that's what this is. Obi-Wan is the more experienced, more mature big brother, and Anakin is the impulsive, arrogant, and whiny little brother. It's a shame that this moment gets overlooked because it's really great acting and dialogue between the two, and it just works really well. We see Jar Jar greeting the Jedi. They meet with Padme, and Padme notices Anakin and how much he has grown. Anakin walks up to her, complimenting her beauty. You can tell how nervous Anakin is as he's stumbling upon his words and trying to sound appropriate. This is a kid that has been in love with this girl and dreaming about this girl for 10 years. It makes perfect sense as to why Anakin is acting all awkward and nervous, and he just gets shut down by Padme. You gotta feel for the guy. My goodness, you've grown. So have you. Grown more beautiful, I mean. Well, f for a senator, I mean. <laughs> and he'll always be that little boy I knew on tattooing. Padme is trying to argue that she doesn't need more security, she needs answers. Obi-Wan refutes her and is trying to make it very clear to her that they are there to protect her, not start an investigation. Anakin chimes in and contradicts what Obi-Wan said 
by making a promise that they'll find out who's trying to kill her, looking at her with determination so that not only will he eliminate the threat, but also impress her and win her over. Obi-Wan becomes stern with Anakin and tells him that they will not do more than is required of them. Anakin replies by stating that he meant it in the interest of protecting her. Obi-Wan lectures Anakin, telling him to follow his lead, but Anakin asks why, which is a sign of disrespect, since Obi-Wan is his superior. Anakin continues and states that the investigation is implied in their mandate, but Obi-Wan is not having it and puts Anakin in his place. This shot definitely looks like Jar Jar is staring at the camera. I don't know if that was a mistake or if it was George trolling the Jar Jar haters. If it was really George trolling the Jar Jar haters, I applaud that. Be petty George, be petty. Anyway, Anakin talks with Jar Jar and has a soliloquy moment. Frustrated and concerned, Padme doesn't feel the same way as he feels about her. Obi-Wan and Jar Jar tried to tell him that she was happy and pleased to see them. We see Zam Wessel and learn that she was the one who is responsible for exploding the ship. Jango Fett tells her to try something more subtle and gives her poisonous centipede-like creatures called Kohans. We cut to Obi-Wan and Anakin making sure security is tight while Padme is trying to sleep. Anakin points out that she covered the cameras and says I don't think she liked me watching her. Now, I think Anakin says this because he is trying to lie to Obi-Wan as to why she covered the cameras. The reason why I believe that is the case is because we later see Obi-Wan say, you're using her as bait. So obviously that is why she covered the cameras, as Anakin pointed out that it was Padme's idea. Anakin then arrogantly says that he can sense everything going on in that room. They have another little friendly banter trying to call each other out on if they can really sense what's going on or if they are just bullshitting. Zam puts the Kohans in the droid and the droid takes off. Now some critics try to point out that this way of assassinating someone is stupid and the lengths they go to criticize it is so mind boggling to me. They really are using mental gymnastics to bitch about this. The reason why this works is because the first time they try to assassinate Padme, it didn't work. And so they are moving on to something a, a lot more subtle. The reason why they have Jango giving it to Zam and then Zam giving it to the droid is so that it makes it very difficult for them to figure out who the assassin really is. The assassins are trying to be very sly. If you keep it very simple and uncomplicated, then it would make it a lot easier to detect the person who is behind the assassination. But if you make it very complicated where it's like this person gives this thing to that person and that person gives it to the droid, it makes the investigation much more difficult on figuring out who's really behind it all. This whole sequence makes perfect sense and is executed very well. The criticism about this is just complete nonsense. We cut to Obi-Wan and Anakin on the balcony and see how Anakin has trouble sleeping because of how much he misses his mother and has nightmares about her. He then expresses how he much rather dream about Padme. Obi-Wan tries to talk sense into Anakin and tells him that he's made a commitment to the Jedi Order and can't be forming attachments like that. He even tells him that she can't be trusted since she's a politician. This interaction shows us that Obi-Wan knows Anakin is in love with Padme, but obviously hides it from the council because of how much he truly does care about him. They have a pretty interesting banter about politics. Obi-Wan is very much against politicians and Anakin is very supportive of Palpatine and Padme. While this is happening, we see the Kohans being dropped off into Padme's bedroom which is a common trope in film where poisonous insects try to kill someone who is asleep. They sense the danger Padme is in and Anakin destroys the bugs. Obi-Wan notices the droid and flies over to grab it. Anakin rushes to find transport and meet with Obi-Wan. Other people rush out and make sure Padme is okay. Obi-Wan is holding on to that droid for dear life to see where it may lead to. And just want to note that a lot of the effects in Coruscant are a mix of CGI and matte paintings. Again, a lot of people want to talk shit about how the prequels were over-reliant on CGI, which is 
horseshit because The Phantom Menace had the most practical effects than any Star Wars film. And if you were to watch the behind the scenes of these movies, you would find out that they used traditional practical effects and models as well as matte paintings. The CGI was really meant to expand the world building and make certain scenes and shots more believable and realistic. It wasn't perfect at times, but again, you have to understand that what they were doing during this time period of filmmaking hasn't been done before. These movies did groundbreaking stuff that revolutionized the digital era of film. Anakin hops onto a vehicle and drives off. Obi-Wan sees the assassin and you'll notice how hard it is for her to aim as Obi-Wan keeps moving around. And so she's left having to shoot the droid. This whole action sequence is pretty awesome. So I'm going to shut up and let you enjoy the sequence. I want to point out one thing from this sequence, which is this shot right here, which is an homage to Lucas's first feature film, THX 1138. We see Obi-Wan give Anakin a brief lesson as he tells him to be patient and rely on the Force to seek her out, and mentions how he needs to be more careful with his lightsaber, putting extreme importance and respect on the weapon. Something Disney doesn't understand. It's your lightsaber. Take it. You keep it. What? I don't need it. The Force is my ally. That's all I need. While walking in the bar, Obi-Wan says, Why do I get the feeling you're going to be the death of me? Expressing his frustration with him about his impulsiveness and disobedience. And it's kind of an ironic line because it turned out to be true in A New Hope. We get a nice look at the cantina, a lot more modern than the cantina we see in A New Hope. Anakin tells Obi-Wan that Zam is a changeling, and Obi-Wan responds by saying that they must be extra careful and tells Anakin to find her while he goes for a drink. While Anakin is walking by, we see people looking at him, and you'll notice that the character in the middle is the actor Ahmed Best, who plays Jar Jar Binks. We get a comic relief scene with Obi-Wan and this drug dealer. Take a look. You want to buy some death sticks? You don't want to sell me death sticks. I don't want to sell you death sticks. You want to go home and rethink your life? I want to go home and rethink my life. I always found that scene cleverly funny. We see Zam Wessel. Now I want to show you this sequence 
and notice the tension that is going on here. The music really builds the tension in this moment, and the camera movement and angles being displayed really makes this scene work so well. We see people get startled, and you'll notice right here that this character is the actor Anthony Daniels, who plays C-3PO. They take Zam outside and interrogate her. They ask who hired her, but she doesn't give an answer. And we see a little bit of rage with Anakin as he aggressively interrogates her into telling them who her boss is. And right before she tells them, she gets killed by a toxic dart. We transition to the Jedi Temple and see Anakin and Obi-Wan speaking to the Council. They tell them what happened and the council gives them orders in response. Obi-Wan is to track down Jango Fett and find out who he is working for, and Anakin is to protect and escort Senator Amidala to Naboo and travel as refugees instead of using registered transport. Anakin points out how it may be difficult to leave the capital since she is the leader of the people who are opposed to the Military Creation Act, and her presence provides a significant value in the Senate. Yoda and Mace tell Anakin that she must respect their judgment because of how much danger she is in and tell him to talk with Palpatine to see if he can speak with Padme about the matter. We cut to Palpatine and Anakin and see them discuss the situation. However, more importantly, we see the grooming begin as we see Palpatine give kudos to Anakin and tells him that he doesn't need guidance and that in time he will be the most powerful Jedi ever, even more powerful than Master Yoda. You'll notice the red surrounding the whole room and the dark cloak Palpatine wears and notice the way he walks. All of these are visual clues that Palpatine is Sidious and the compassionate, caring Chancellor he displays on screen is really just a facade of who he really is. We cut to Obi-Wan talking with Yoda and Mace as they walk across the hallways of the Jedi Temple. Obi-Wan expresses his concern for Anakin and feels that he's not ready for this assignment and believes he's becoming too arrogant. Yoda is in agreement with Obi-Wan and adds that it is a flaw that has become more common recently in the Order, even the older, more experienced ones. Mace reminds Obi-Wan of the prophecy, basically telling him to not worry too much about it and trust in what the Force has prophesied. I don't know about you guys, but to me this shot looks a little outdated. This isn't me bashing it because a lot of what George was doing at the time was groundbreaking stuff. A lot of the digital work being done in this movie has never been done before, which leads me to this fun fact. This movie was the first blockbuster movie to ever be shot digitally. And if you compare to today's digital effects, you'll probably be able to point out some outdated CGI. However, I would argue most of the effects hold up and look better than some movies we see today. But when judging films like these, you have to take it into account and take it into context as a lot of this was brand new. If we were to go back and look at movies in the past, you'll be able to see some of the outdated effects. For example, Rear Window. And Psycho. Like, it would be unfair to bash and heavily criticize it because they didn't have the technology like we have today. And that's the same thing with this movie and the other prequel films. It's unfair to compare these effects with other films of today. A proper comparison would be movies of that same year or movies two or three years prior or after. We cut to Padme's apartment and you'll notice the window that Obi-Wan broke being replaced. You see Padme talking with Jar Jar and telling him to fill in for her while she is away. She walks away quickly upset about leaving 
Anakin has a mature moment when he tells Padme that sometimes we must let go of our pride and do what is requested. Padme hears this and is impressed by his mature and wise statement. However, Anakin starts to complain about Obi-Wan and expresses his frustration with his progress as a Jedi and feels that he is ready to move up in the ranks. Padme tells him that mentors give us more criticism than we would like, but that's how we grow and develop character. She walks up to him and tells him to not grow up too fast as a sign that she's starting to fall for him. Anakin gets up and tries to flirt with Padme, but Padme establishes control and tells him to stop and then she walks away, while Anakin smiles and looks at her. This scene really shows the complexity of Anakin as he can be smart, and wise, however, lose control and become aggressive and impatient and bratty. This depicts adolescents in, in general as teenagers typically feel they've arrived in life, but in reality, they have so much to learn and so much to experience. And that is something I think we can all relate to, and it's one of the reasons why Anakin is my favorite character. You know, I think a lot of people who don't like Anakin really wanted him to be simple. They basically wanted Anakin to be Han Solo-esque, where he's a cool and smooth guy that is just a badass. Instead, they got a character that is more complex, a character with personality traits of an awkward, arrogant, bratty, adolescent teenager, but a very skillful warrior and pilot. And I think it really ties into the themes of Star Wars, especially the theme of how fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering and we see that with Anakin's arc and his downfall into the dark side and I believe it was executed perfectly as it got the point across. Time goes by as we see Anakin and Padme getting dropped off to leave Coruscant. Dorme walks up to Padme worried about her safety. Obi-Wan looks at Anakin and talks to him sternly telling him to not do anything without first consulting him or the council. They all say goodbye, and as Padme and Anakin walk away from the ship, Padme expresses the fact she is starting to feel afraid. But Anakin tries to comfort her by saying that this is his first assignment on his own, and he feels afraid too. It makes her laugh by saying, don't worry, we have R2 with us. Obi-Wan expresses his concern about Anakin to Captain Typho, hoping Anakin doesn't do anything foolish. Anakin and Padme take off as they are now on their way to Naboo. We cut to Obi-Wan entering a diner, which was done as an homage to George Lucas's film, American Graffiti. We get introduced to Dex, a friend of Obi-Wan. I love Dex. His whole vibe and demeanor just lifts your spirits. Obi-Wan asks Dex what the toxic dart is and where it might come from. Dex tells him that he hasn't seen one of those since he was prospecting on the sub Tyrell, beyond the Outer Rim and tells him that it belongs to them cloners. In addition, he tells him that it's properly called a Kamino Saber Dart. Obi-Wan wonders why it didn't show up in the analysis archives, which makes the audience infer that he did try to figure it out before going to Dex. Dex points out the cuts on the side that give it away and that the droids only focus on symbols and teases him saying that I should think that you Jedi would have more respect for the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Obi-Wan responds by saying, well, if droids could think, there'd be none of us here, would there? This is important because it foreshadows what is to come in the next movie that turns out to be the downfall of the Jedi. Obi-Wan asks where Kamino is, and Dex says it's beyond the Outer Rim, outside the Rishi Maze. He adds that the Kaminoans keep to themselves and that they are cloners. Damn good ones, too. Obi-Wan asks if they are friendly, but Dex replies saying that it depends on how big your pocketbook is. The only problem I have with this scene is that I think it would be nice if we got a little more exposition on what their friendship was like and what Dex did in the past that can make the viewer understand a little bit better as to how he was able to know all this information. We get a little bit of it in which we can infer that he has traveled across the galaxy and knows a lot, but I think more backstory on Dex would have made this scene easier to grasp and have the viewer understand better as to why Obi-Wan went to Dex instead of another person or thing. We cut to the Jedi Temple Library and we see Obi-Wan looking at Count Dooku's 
bust statue while waiting for Jocasta New. Fun fact about the scene, there are five bust statues, not including Christopher Lee, that are of the Star Wars staff. And they are George Lucas, Rob Coleman, John Knoll, Pablo Hellman, and Brian Gernand. However, I was only able to identify George and Rob, which are right here and here. Everyone else, unfortunately, was too difficult to find. Obi-Wan talks with Joe Castanu about his troubles in finding Kamino and points out that it doesn't show up in the archive charts. Joe Castanu, however, tries to be blunt with him that if a system doesn't appear on their records, then it does not exist, and she says it very arrogantly as if the archives are never wrong. We cut to Anakin and Padme on board the transport that's heading to Naboo. We see them eating and Padme brings up how difficult a Jedi's, a Jedi's life must be, not being able to visit the places you like or do the things you like, and Anakin interrupts, or being with the people that I love. Obviously kind of giving her a hint that he is in love with her, but she's not taking him too seriously and asks, are you allowed to love? I thought that was forbidden for a Jedi. Anakin responds by saying attachment is forbidden. Possession is forbidden. Compassion, which I would define as unconditional love, is central to a Jedi's life. So you might say that we are encouraged to love. And you start to hear their love theme play in the background. When the camera switches over to Padme, you start to see her fall in love with Anakin a bit more as she smiles and says, You've changed so much. Anakin responds by saying, Ah, oh, you haven't changed a bit. You're exactly the way I remember you in my dreams. Padme is stunned when she hears this and is kind of embarrassed by it as she starts to realize that Anakin's love for her is more serious than she thought. In the next scene, we see Obi-Wan walking towards Yoda and we see an EU character named Ayla Sakura making her first appearance in the films. We see Yoda giving a training lesson to the younglings. Obi-Wan tells Yoda his troubles in finding Kamino, and Yoda mocks him and is embarrassed for him that he's not able to find it. Yoda has the younglings gather around and help Obi-Wan solve his problem. I want to show a clip of this scene because it's a nice heartwarming moment and it depicts how George doesn't underestimate the mind of a child and that they're smarter than we think. But it isn't. Gravity is pulling all the stars in the area towards this spot. Hmm. Gravity's silhouette remains, but the star and all the planets disappeared they have. How can this be? Hmm. A thought? Anyone? Master? Because someone erased it from the archive memory. <laughs> Truly wonderful the mind of a child is. Obi-Wan wonders how anyone can empty information from the archives, as he believed that was impossible. Yoda is puzzled by this as well and states that he'll have to meditate on it and figure out why someone would do that. Anakin and Padme arrive on Naboo, a really nice shot right here, very artistic, nice detail in the architecture, really visually pleasing. Padme and Anakin discuss Padme's term as queen as Padme feels she might have been too young to serve as queen. But Anakin tries to give her kudos by telling her that the people thought she did a good job and that they even tried to amend the constitution to have her stay in office. She then talks about how the next queen asked her to serve as senator. She couldn't refuse her. Anakin gives Padme more praise as he agrees with the queen and tells her that the Republic needs her. In the next scene, we see them gathered around with the representatives of Naboo as they discuss the Military Creation Act. Padme believes if the Republic creates an army, it would lead them into civil war. C.O. Bibble expresses his opinions on the matter, saying, It's unthinkable. There hasn't been a full-scale war since the formation of the Republic. This goes back to what I discussed before in that the Republic now is different from what the from what the Republic was over a thousand years ago. According to the expanded universe, there were wars between the Sith and the Jedi until the seventh battle of Rusan, 
which sparked the Rusan Reformation, and this is all mentioned in the Darth Bane trilogy. Anyway, the Queen of Naboo asks Padme if there's any way through negotiations to bring the Separatists back into the Republic. Padme responds by saying, not if they feel threatened. My guess is they'll turn to the Trade Federation or the Commerce Guild for help, and points out the corruption in the Senate, and how after four trials in the Supreme Court, Newt Gunray is still the Viceroy of the Trade Federation. The Queen gets up and everyone follows her lead. She begins to bring up Padme's safety situation, and CEO Bipple walks forward and asks for Anakin's suggestion, thinking he's a Jedi Master. But Anakin gets owned by Padme as she tells CEO Bibble that Anakin is only a Padawan learner. Anakin obviously gets triggered by this, but Padme ignores him and tells the Queen that she was thinking of staying in the Lake Country where it's very isolated. However, Anakin keeps trying to get her attention and tries to regain his manhood, but he fails as Padme tells him that this is her home and she knows it very well and that she, and that she knows what she is doing. We see Obi-Wan's ship as he arrives on Kamino. And this is where we'll come to a stopping point. I hope you enjoyed the video and this series so far. I love doing these videos because I'm really passionate about these films and I love diving into the details and it allows me to experiment and figure out ways to make my videos better. It's really a way for me to keep improving as a content creator. For those who watch these, I thank you for tuning in and diving in deep with these films. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. With that being said, please like, subscribe, and comment. And may the Force be with you.